Welcome to the Zoe Routh Leadership Podcast, where we explore the future and what this means for your leadership. We ask the big questions. What's happening on the horizon? What does this mean for us? And most importantly, what skills do I need now for leadership of the future? It's time to explore. Let's go. Hey, it's Zoe. As leaders, we are all unique. We have unique strengths and we have unique challenges. And as leaders, do we really leverage our strengths and do we design systems to take account of our challenges slash weaknesses? Well, my guests today, I have two of them and they are both Canadian. So you got a three for one Canadian show on tonight or today or whenever you're listening. And they are experts in the field of building leadership development and leadership systems. They are a mother-daughter team, and they bring together organizational leadership development that looks at both the psychology and systems of leadership and bridge the two together. Their names are Dr. Anne Janet Saris and her daughter, Heather Janet Saris Hilliard. They have been working together for some 25 years and have a business called Caliber Leadership Systems, and their website is JanetSarisHilliard.com. They have a fabulous new book out, So You Think You Can Lead, and we dive into a great conversation about the psychology, psych, psychology? psychology of humans <laughs> and the systems of leadership and how to bridge the two. Let's get into it. Woohoo! Well, we've got some Canadians on the show today. We've got Anne from Toronto and we've got Heather from Vancouver, Nanaimo, actually. Welcome to the show, the both of you. Thank you. We really appreciate being here and, and talking to someone on the other side of the world. <laughs> Yeah, it's a regular occurrence for me being a Canadian living in Australia. And it's always such a miracle when we do manage to connect around the globe and to share amazing ideas. Thank you so much for sending me a copy of your latest book, So You Think You Can Lead. It was very comprehensive and thorough in helping new leaders especially dive into the rigors of what it means to front up and be responsible to and responsible for a team. And it's uh, it's pretty exciting. But first of all, like I mentioned before we hit record, I've never interviewed two people at once. So new opportunity here. How did you end up working together, a mother-daughter team? Well, we have a, a bit of an unusual story in that uh, well, Anne was, um, had me at a very young age and put me up for adoption. And so she and I actually didn't meet until I was well into my 20s. And there's only 17 years, uh, well, 16 years, one week shy of 17, <laughs> but you get the story. And we immediately connected around, we were doing work in different spaces. I was doing consulting with a large uh, human resources consulting firm and was doing work as an executive coach and a psychotherapist. And as we started to connect around our work and our sort of shared interests around people and potential, we started to sort of think about how our two diverse backgrounds yet similar interests could actually come together. And so when I had uh, my first child, rather than going back to the consulting firm that I was at, Anna and I thought, hey, let's go into business together. And that was almost 25 years ago now that we've been uh, in business together in this. Uh, and so as we forged our personal relationship, we also became business partners at the same time. That's just amazing. My like jaw is on the floor right now. I'm like, wow. <laughs> Wow, that's really amazing. So if it's okay, can I ask, how did that rediscovery of each other occur? And then, oh my God, what a challenge to give up your daughter at such a young age and then to have her reappear in your life 17 years later, or was it a little, in your 20s, you said? 28, so, 28. I was in my late 20s, yeah. Late 20s, wow. So how did that happen? Well, in Canada, they have a, an adoption registry. And that you can sign up with as biological parents um, and you put your name in so that it's an, an, a non-invasive process where if the child wants to connect with their biological family, they're the ones that initiate it and then the organization gets in touch with the parents. In Heather's case, both her biological father's mother and I had both signed up 
and they contacted us. And then we went through this process of writing letters and talking on the telephone prior to getting together and meeting. And in in some ways, having having the business connection made it somewhat easier because there were no roles to go into. <laughs> you know, I wasn't going to come onto the scene and suddenly be Heather's mother. She didn't need a mother. She had one. And there's, um, we're close enough in age that we could be friends. Um, and so we forged both the friendship and the business partnership at the same time. Without that messy, oh, my daughter. <laughs> Without the messiness yeah. of that. <laughs> yeah. <Jeez. laughs> but, and, and, you know, we learned a lot about, you know, sort of in leading, and we always bring our, our work, our own personal experiences into our work and, and sort of as part of what we sort of generate for ourselves with our clients and thinking about, well, if we're navigating this, you know, how are others? And it was really interesting when Anne and I first started working together, we didn't tell anybody we were related. And so I, you know, and even to this day in working together, I refer to as her as Anne at work and every now and then someone will say, well, how's your mother doing? And I have to think about it, right? Because I have two of them. <laughs> and, and so you sort of come out of it, sort of it's like, you know, like we do, we talk about with leaders, it's like things that we're, we want to protect and maybe hide a little bit. And then, you know, as we get more comfortable and more confident, we allow these things to emerge more and where all of our clients now know our whole story and, you know, sort of where our businesses come from and how we've worked together. And most of our clients work with both of us. And so especially our corporate clients. So we have this sort of really interesting way that we've been able to forge because we have you know, a shared approach, but really different backgrounds and very different strengths. And it's just allowed us to do the work that we've done with leaderships over the last couple of decades, because of those differences and those distinctions without any of the typical, you know, when I was your child, and we grew up together, because as Anne said, we, we came into this as friends and business partners, and our mother daughter relationship emerged from that. Absolutely. I think it's a wonderful thing to showcase with clients, I can imagine, a couple of things. One is sitting in the wonder mix of emotions. I can only I'm projecting now and imagining what that would be like to discover a new part of yourself and to create a new story about yourself and identity and in relationship with another, which is what we're constantly doing in leadership, is we're discovering new parts of ourselves as we build new stories with others around us and to model being able to sit in the chaos of all that and the confusion of all that and to find a new story and a new path forward in that. What were the key things that each of you brought to the table in terms of your own personal resilience to help navigate that complex, a new emerging story? Well, from my perspective, I was very aware of not letting Heather lead in the process and allowing certain things to unfold and not pushing, even though it's in my nature to push, that I knew that I couldn't, I, I couldn't go into any role. And I think when we look at leaders as well, now that I'm in this role, I get to be directive and tell people what to do. And I, you know, I get people should respect me. And without having any role to go into or thinking that I should behave in any particular way, from my perspective, it, it left me feeling much more anxious because there was nothing to hold on to. But at the same time, we both had enough space to get to know each other without pushing anything on either one of us. So it's kind of like letting the situation unfold and just being fully present in what is unfolding without expect, well, perhaps with hope and maybe without expectation. Yeah. Well, <laughs> with hope, with, with hope and desire and, you know, with, with all of me wanting to go, okay, you know, all of those years are gone. I'm back here and we're back together. And so, so there's that natural wanting to push and, and some, in some way being instinctual while at the same time intuitively knowing that would never work. You know, if I push, I'll push her away. Yeah. And from your part, Heather, how did it work for you? Well, I think, you know, it, it was one of those things, situations where it, it, you know, really helped, you know, with that notion of this is going to be uncomfortable, right? Because there's no reference point. And, and if you look at, 
you know, stories how others have done it. And, you know, as, as leaders, we're always sort of reading to hear about others' leaders' experiences and what did they do and how did they navigate that situation so that we can, you know, try and figure it out by, you know, copying or, or learning from their mistakes, right? Here are the things I did wrong. Well, in a journey like ours, there's no reference point. There's nobody else out there that's done it quite like we've done it too, because we had that commonality of that interest from a business perspective, from a intellectual perspective. And, and our, we have similar personalities in that we both like to play with ideas and look at the possibilities and, you, you know, sort of cu- curiosity that we bring to, to that construct. And so it was really tough to sort of think I'm, I'm doing all of this and I'm building all of this, but it's not necessarily on a secure foundation because it was all so new. And I think that's, you know, again, I bring the analogy over to leading. When you start leading other people, you don't have a secure foundation because you don't have the skills, you don't have the experience, and you're having to tolerate that discomfort in an effort to avoid creating messes or an effort of, you know, adopting bad habits. And let me tell you, Anna and I had rough spots. Like it was not a smooth ride and it was, you know, like moving forward, moving back, having to regroup around things because we were, you know, unfolding all of this. And at the same time, you know, I was a new mother. I was a new business. Like this was the first time for me of being an entrepreneur and had been an entrepreneur before. So it was so many sort of firsts all at once. <laughs> and so, Jeez. so I guess if you ask what I brought into it, I have a really high tolerance for chaos. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What's that? New baby, new business, a new, new storyline right. from your birth mother. Yeah. Oh, that's a lot. That's that, so. that is really a lot. <laughs> that's a lot to sit with. And you're right. I think when we move into leadership roles, we don't necessarily know. We don't know what we don't know. That sort of unconscious incompetence, or maybe then it becomes conscious incompetence as we stumble our way through it. So let's turn now to look at the book that you've you've released, So You Think You Can Lead. You make a distinction there between leadership and management, and that is an important distinction. So in your words, in your perspective, what what is the difference between the two? The way I, d- I tend to describe this is that when, when we're leading, we're in front, we're defining, we are in that bigger picture, and we're seeing our desired future state and breaking it down in a way where we can influence the behavior of others to get them to follow, because a leader is only a leader when they have followers. And again, this is really high level around the description because we can go into a lot of detail around this, but management is overseeing the execution of what the leader has presented and what the leader has defined. And so managers don't necessarily define what that bigger picture is or the strategic goals, but they're responsible for the execution and ensuring that their direct reports are aligned with their day-to-day expectation. So it's more in the moment. It's more of the particular as opposed to that big, bigger picture. One of the things that we'll often talk about is is when we're in the act of leading, you know, there's a people focus to that role, right? When we're really stepping in and, and leading is we are thinking about how do I move my people along? How do I get, uh, as Anne pointed out, my people to follow? You know, where are those challenges that we're going to encounter as it relates to the people? Whereas when when we're in that management, it's about task and it's the task execution is the focus and, and where we're really looking to it. And, and they're not thinking about the people and are my people following and where are my people at in terms of their development? It's, it's we're just trying to get through it to get it done. And again, leading is, we always say, leading is a verb so there's a whole lot of activity to it but it's more focused on the the people and how we go through the people to get the task or the work done or the goal accomplished so it's looking at things more holistically and not just in that more sort of linear task-based approach that we often see people regardless of their title tending to work out of yeah i think that task relationship balance is is a perennial tension that people leaders need to manage. You can't just do all people and you can't just do all tax and task because <laughs> that both lead to disasters in terms of excess focus. Hey, it's Zoe. If you're enjoying these leadership insights, join us in the Amplifiers Academy. It's bite-sized leadership development through self-paced videos and exercises, templates, checklists, resources, 
and an online community to connect with other leaders. It's Amplifiers Academy, your gateway to better, stronger leadership. See you there. I'm curious also about how you weave in neurobiology of human development and systems thinking. So that's one of the things that came through in your profile. I'm like, right, neurobiology of human development is really fascinating topic in itself. And systems thinking is my other passion as well. So I'm like, wow, okay, how do you blend the two? What led you to looking at both those things and weaving them together? (laughs) It's Mostly because of our backgrounds, because I come from a psychological background, psychotherapy and developmental psychotherapy specifically, and also being when I was introduced to Carl Jung and his theory of psychological type very early on in my training, I fell in love with his developmental model especially around psychological type and how our brains are organized and marrying that to Heather's approach to systems at work. And Heather, you can jump in and talk about that. But if you think about the book and how we've put this system of performance development in terms of looking at marrying that with what employees need every step of the way. And so we're looking at a system that we create to hold people as well as what people need in every step of their development. And and so we have both that developmental perspective as well as having to have a system to hold behavior and keep people in alignment with. This is, uh, you know, from our experience, um, when Anne and I first met, actually, it was one of the things that we really noticed was, so I was doing the work in organizations around designing systems that were intended to result in certain performance or certain outcomes. And Anne was doing the one-on-one work to look at it from a behavioral perspective. What are the behaviors you need? How do you need to develop those behaviors? And we found that there was a limitation of using either of these approaches in isolation. And so we could get this great system, but then not get the behavior of the leaders or the people to really work with that system and vice versa. She was working on the behavior, but then they didn't have the system for continuity for how do we bring it out into the organization in a bigger way? How do we get those everybody following and working in, in that consistent manner? And so when we started our business, the whole basis of it was people systems results. And so we know that we have to look at both because, you know, if we want to create that sustained organizational change or that really have that impact on behavior and leadership in particular, on culture in organizations, we have to look at it from both sides of the equation. And and a lot of the leaders that we work with, they do have that gap. They don't have the, the skills, so they don't have the behavioral side. But a lot of the times when we go in, there's an absolute absence of leadership systems. You know, everything from how do you manage your meetings? What's on the agenda? How do you do your planning processes? How do you manage performance of the business or of the individuals? And that lack of systems combined with the, the, the sort of gaps from a developmental perspective is really what causes a lot of the dysfunction that we see in our client organizations that we work with them, both from a people development perspective and a systems development perspective in order to alleviate those dysfunctions. That makes a lot of sense to me in terms of being able to diagnose where where the problems are. Yes. So walking into an organization and if you're tasked with developing the human systems alongside the human development systems, is that the framework that you look at in terms of, so this is what I'm visualizing and you can correct me, but you do it a little bit differently. When a person comes into the organization, they come in with existing skills and talents and yet they have a lot to develop. So the process in which you take them through their experience in the organization is centered around developing certain capabilities as well as meeting their human needs as they go through. Is that how you approach your design? Well, in part it is. And we also look to what are the predominant needs or what are the drivers of that person's behavior. And when you look at the organization as, a, as an organism, how will that person fit and align themselves And what do they need to integrate them into the existing culture while maintaining their sense of identity and satisfying their needs? And so it's not an either or. 
we work a lot with entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs are always fun because they're, you know, they're somewhere in the future and thinking that their business is going to take care of itself and grow itself without having any systems in place. And quite often they have us come in and help them with the, the systems that the people in their organization need because their people are floundering as a result of that entrepreneur not spending the time developing up their leadership capabilities. But that's the organism of the entrepreneur, you see. It's like we're not trying to change the entrepreneur, but we're trying to, from a systems perspective, make the business align with how the leader leads it. Wow. (laughs) So I'm thinking about that and from a practical point of view too. You use particular psychometric assessments to help profile people's preferences. Which ones do you tend to use? Well, we have our own system called the Striving Styles Personality System, and and it's an evolution of the Myers-Briggs based on Carl Jung's psychological type. But what we did was we integrated emotional intelligence and looking at how each of the 16 personality types, they have emotional drivers and they have emotional needs that have to be met in order for them to feel truly satisfied and successful at work. And they will lead in a particular way and they will have certain needs at work. And And so by, by using our system, we have this way of fast tracking, okay, here's how your brain is organized. That means that you're going to need this, but you're also going to have a blind spot around these things when you're building your, your business. And so we'll come in and create a roadmap for them, looking at what systems that that leader might need to really keep them focused forward and keep them growing their business and not lose their people, which is what they tend to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can see that. So before I chime in a little bit, Heather, did you want to add anything to what Anne said? Yeah, I just wanted to give a, another example of one. Of, we have a project that's ongoing right now with a client of ours, which I think is a really good example of this sort of dual approach around looking at it from a the development perspective and also from a systems perspective. Is the, And the client was having has grown a lot, so they're having issues from a quality management perspective. So we've been working with them because, you know, they have bits and pieces of a system, but we, you know, sort of working to knit it together. But more importantly, what we're doing is that what the real challenge for them is, yeah, they've got gaps in their system, but the system on their own is not going to be it. What it is is that the leaders are so permissive that nobody is holding anybody accountable or setting any expectations from a compliance perspective. And so when we look at it from a development perspective is we've got all of these leaders who are so afraid and conflict avoidant that if someone new comes into the organization and says, well, I don't want to do it that way. I want to do it the way I'm used to doing it at company X instead of where I am now. They just say, okay, well, you know, do whatever you want. And so the problem is we can create any system in the world, the best system in the world from a quality management. We can tick all of those boxes. We make sure all the steps are there. But if the leaders are not actually willing to hold people and say to people, this is non-negotiable, like you have to comply. And so the, and it's taken us a while to get there and, and to get all of the executives on the same page as to what they mean by quality and, and how this is going to work. And so we just actually, you know, a few weeks ago did it where the executives got up and front of the uh, the whole operational group and said, these are our non-negotiables. And and we are going to now move into a place where ever, we're going to equip you. We're going to give you what you need, but compliance is not up for, it's not optional. And, and so that's the huge shift, but developmentally it's taken us a while working individually with those executives. Now we're working with the next tier of leaders on really equipping them from an accountability compliance perspective so that they're comfortable with it, that they have the language, they can have the conversations. And then they're also looking at their own systems to for checking on compliance because they have none right now while at the same time we're strengthening up the system to fill up any gaps and to deal with any of the barriers that the system might have so we had to do both because doing one versus and without the other would not have driven the kind of change that we're looking to get in the organization over the hundreds of folks that are impacted by this in the time period that we're trying to work from so it's it's always that pushing around that dual approach and but meeting the client where they're at 
So it's, it's part of that whole, you know, the neurobiology of it, as Anne was saying, is we understand their personality, we know what they need, and we know how to help them to move to that next place so that they can really make these systems work for their business. It's an interesting tension to manage also in that with the personality profiles and seeing their emotional needs and where their blind spots are and being fully accepting of that and knowing that there's strengths and deficits to that and you have to design systems around that without going, oh, that's your weakness, so we'll just design a system around it, and also encouraging them to build skills. So I'm thinking about that too. Like in Myers-Briggs, I profile ENFP. So very excited about everything. <laughs> very, <laughs> you know, the the shiny object syndrome is definitely at play for me. I'm like, oh, let's go on down and explore this little journey instead of like, sticking to task and following through. So if we take that as an example, someone like me who's got interest in multiple things, one of my blind spots would be just systematically following through to the nth degree. How do you do skill development and system design at the same time with a, with a human like me? We, we tend to come at it from the perspective of, if for an entrepreneur in particular, you can never build a job profile for them that they're no longer going to want to work at that job, you see, or change their personality or, or have so many need dissatisfiers in the role that they're just going to go into their um, self-protective behaviors anyway, and we, which, of course, for an ENFP, you'll just want to get out of there and do something different because you don't like the way you, the experience that you're having, you see. And, and so it's we come at, out of that model of you delegate everything except your unique abilities because it's your unique abilities that is a driving force in the business. And to do that, one needs to really build a team around that can manage up effectively. Because, again, you can't force people to like details if your brain isn't wired that way. It exhausts you, and then you just get cranky, right? And, and that's what happens in our neurobiology. Heather and I have, you know, we're intuitive types as well, you see. And so as a result of that, we can only tolerate being in the detail for so long. We like to be in the future. We like to be in that bigger picture. And so building a team of people around that that entrepreneur and using yourself as that example that will not get upset at you for being the big personality that you are and that holding you to things so that you don't go, oh, you know, we call it the, oh, look a bird, right? That there's that shiny object and let's go go that way that reminding you gently of what your commitments are and bringing you back to it, you see? The other thing I would just add to that, because of course, when we look at it from a brain functioning perspective, you know, you're, you, as an ENFP, we're looking at, you know, really strong right brain functions. And the part of the brain we use for planning is the this, you know, the left rational brain. So defining comes out of that. And so we also have some really simplistic systems, tools. We often reference them as that, you know, folks that need to work on the development of that particular brain function, where you're doing that planning and organizing is what, if I want to get to this, if I want to follow this through, what do I need to do? What would that look? like that allows them to go into that activity while still feeling, as Anne said, that it's comfortable. Like it's not so onerous that it's going to shut down. And a lot of the times we'll find too, and we say this to our clients all the time, is recognizing that if you're having to do tasks that are using that part of the brain that you don't enjoy doing it, do it with someone who does, because then it's more fun, right? So uh, we have an ENFP client who's absolutely brilliant. And, you know, her, just same thing. It's like, you know, trying to herd it all in <laughs> so it, it, it can work with something. And she just, you know, just having that ability, she talks and, and we develop it for her, right? So it's all her idea. All we're doing is capturing it because that's our strength and able to put it back into a plan that, that she can work with and she can work with her people on. So it's the, also that aspect where we find with a lot of leaders is that unwillingness to, to sort of say, you know what, this isn't something that I enjoy. This this isn't something that I'm particularly good at. So where can I find help? Right. And, and the best leaders, the ones that are most, you know, that we find anyway that we work with are the ones that do recognize that they recognize that their strengths lie in different areas and, and they can hone in on that spot or that point in time where they really do need that help and support. 
That's beautiful. I think that, that that's good. And it, it gives me confidence because I have a team that is a very happy to give me feedback <laughs> <laughs> and say, no, don't do that. That's too distracting. <laughs> so we, we had a planning meeting last week and I'm like, I was thinking about this, doing this. And my business manager said, no, <laughs> As you're trying to do too much and it's going to be distracting. And I'm like, okay, park that, move on. Yeah, <laughs> so that so was, that was really helpful. Perfect. Uh, so some of the things you yeah. talk about in your book are about bad leadership habits, having good leaders with bad leadership habits. Nobody likes bad habits. I mean, you know that they're bad habits. What are some bad habits that you see good leaders fall into? Yeah, well, number one, and the reason why we wrote the book is that permissiveness, right? That absolute, you know, I'm not going to hold anybody accountable to anything. I'm, I'm not going to deliver feedback. I'm not going to correct performance. I mean, some of the stories we have are just unbelievable where, you know, they'll tell themselves things like, well, they'll figure it out eventually, or, you know, they're executives. They should, they should already know, right? <laughs> you know, so it's, it's the way in which one of the bad habits that leaders have is that, you know, that emotional reasoning that they use to avoid situations that make them uncomfortable when they really need to be stepping in and leading, right? And so that very self-protective, but, and that's what a lot of the bad habits are around. And it's more, I want to hold and preserve my image of myself as a great leader. And I only want to do the parts of leading that are fun and where I get to, you know, look like the good guy or the great gal but I'm really not going to go into some of those places. But permissiveness is a, you know, especially up, up here in Canada where there's a low tolerance for interpersonal conflict. Uh, there's a lot of leaders who just do not manage their people or manage their performance. Yeah, that's a pretty big one. Absolutely. It's like, oh, if I just ignore it, maybe it'll fix itself. And it doesn't. <laughs> well, and, and when you look at some of the causes, some of the beliefs that cause someone who's never been in a senior leadership role to come into that role and not think that they need a development plan, that they believe that they're a good leader. And this is where we do the quote unquote, you know, you try and be a good leader and all you're doing is you're going to be leading based on your personality, not on a skill set. Because you're not breaking it down into competencies where you're looking externally and objectively at what does this job require and using accurate self-assessment to be able to say, I need to be able to do more of this. And yes, I am permissive and I have difficulty with setting expectations, never had to do it before. I need some tricks. And because their egos get in the way, because the culture in the organization pretty much promotes the idea that, well, we promoted you, you should know the job. <laughs> it's like, but I've never done it before. Even right up to that VP level. And not uh, Our clients that don't even distinguish if someone gets promoted to an executive VP role, how is that different than a VP? And what do I have to do differently? And there's nothing defining or describing what that is. And and so they just fumble their way through and do the best they can. Yeah, I think it's the arrogance of intelligence. I've seen this in a number of different organizations where it's a professional services firm. They hire very smart people, very intelligent people to do the work. And then they say, okay, you've been here, you're earning well, we'll now make you a director. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and they just assume they're smart, they'll work it out. They don't work it out and they fumble their way through it. And I think it, it's that, that arrogance. Because I'm smart, I can figure it out. And they just stumble all over the place, not realizing that they were smart in their field, their professional field, because they applied themselves and learned it. And they can take that natural aptitude to apply to the field of leadership. And it's a totally different set of skills. And it, it just boggles my mind that smart people don't realize that it is a totally different set of skills and they'll just work it out. Is that something that you experience as well? Yeah. Yeah. And, and if you think about it from the organization's sort of resistance to invest in the development, I mean, we, we laugh because, you know, we talk about leadership is the only profession that you're not required to do any training or have, meet any criteria before you get promoted into the, the role, right? And so when you think about it from that perspective, and then they get in there, and then they're in there for a long time. And I think the research says something like they're in there for at least 10 years, most leaders, before they have any training. And the problem is, as we know, 
that the part of our, our brain that we use for leading is often not the one that got us to that success uh, that we've gotten so far. And that leading is experiential. It's not intellect driven, right? I have to have the experience and I have to build over time through those experiences. And But if I have no skills and I don't have any tools that I can at least use to get started on and it's all self-directed, and oftentimes, you know, we, because there's no formalized training for people, it's, uh, you know, the, it's sort of the idea is, well, now you're a leader, so it's a whole, you must be born to lead and let's go for it, right? And we look at, then we get fall into these things where we might even try to do some things the, the right way, but the, the first time it doesn't work, we bail on it. And, and that's what we talk about it being experiential is we often have to do it a few times before we get comfortable enough where we're actually being effective at it. And, you know, as Ann pointed out, right up through to the CEOs we work with that the big gaps in their skill set because they have not gone after development around their leadership skills in the same way they would go after development on a professional level. And we've got, you know, executive level clients who spend a fortune every year on keeping up with their profession, even though their core job job is to lead others who should be the experts in the profession, but they do nothing to actually strengthen up their leadership capabilities. It's astonishing, really. And I've interviewed a lot of former military leaders, and that's one of the things they find quite jarring, going from a career in the military to corporate, is there's no investment in people leadership training, and it's embedded in the military protocols yeah. as something that's absolutely essential. And they're like, why are we not investing in our developing our people? <laughs> <laughs> and we flag this in the book around that need to develop followership in people. It's the assumption that because I'm a leader, people are going to follow me. And, you know, then they complain when the people aren't following them because, of course, we have a whole generation of younger people who come in and say, what's in this for me? And I want to do it my own way and nobody should tell me what to do. And there's this huge gap that's developed because leaders don't say, okay, in order to be successful in your role and get promoted, you have to demonstrate to me that you can actually follow and align yourself with the goals of this organization and the expectations for the role. And they're afraid to say things as simple as that. Oh, oh won't I offend them? It's like, no, <laughs> it's, your, it's your job to define things, you're a leader, and the reluctance and their fear around it, you see, stock gets in the way. And of course, then they blame the employees. Yeah, we need to absolutely start to get over that, that those core emotional intelligence glitches that we have. One of the questions I have about leadership of the future is, well, it's not even the future, it's now. <laughs> How do leaders contend with remote hybrid working? What are the things that they need to bring to the fore in order to continue to develop good culture and accountability and performance in a remote and hybrid environment? What have you instituted or implemented with your clients? So one of the things we've talked a lot with them about is is frequency, right? So, you know, a lot of our organizations still, you know, our clients aside, a lot of organizations that we come in to work with, they, they're doing like the annual performance review, let's say. And, and so that cycle doesn't work in any context, but it especially doesn't work in the virtual context because what you need to be continuously doing as a leader is – clarifying the expectations and then following up to make sure the expectations are being met and then doing the feedback cycle actually more frequently because you don't have that opportunity to observe in the same way you might in a workplace, right? So if someone is needs some correction or if someone needs some support in order to get them to the next level, the frequency with which those conversations need to be having is actually more rather than less. And what we've noticed in that kind of the first push into the virtual, everybody was so, you know, just trying to survive that experience but now that what we're on the other side is like we're you're having to put time and attention to this and you can't just sort of hope that employees are getting it and coming along you have to check in with them more frequently the challenge that most of our clients are experiencing and is that you know for many many years most organizations have kept their management ranks really thin 
thin to the point where most of the folks that are leading are doing the leadership part kind of off the side of their desk, you know, because their core job is actually to get things done, right? To get tasks done, there's work output that they need to do. And in, in the virtual environment, you have to rethink the design of leadership roles. And that's the work that we're going into with a lot of our clients now is, is really looking at capacity and, and where does their time need to go? And if we need them to be spending 40% of their time, depending on the size of their team, in those kinds of conversations, those meetings, those directing, the development piece of it, um, the cultural component, really cultivating the, the virtual cultural component, what gets moved off of their desk and what's the staffing that might need to support that. And, and we've watched, we've seen organizations of all sizes where they've really emphasized profit over having the right staffing model at the expense of the folks in the leadership levels. And so this might be a little bit of a time to kind of rethink that, you know, from a social perspective, what can the organization actually bear? Because if the leaders don't have the time to manage in that environment, to lead in that environment effectively, performance is going to drop and profits are ultimately going to drop as well. So trying to really get that connection is, is an important part of the conversation these days. I think that's really useful insight. And yeah, I think it's timely too, where a lot of the leaders I'm working with as well are looking at organizational redesign, restructures. And some of it is about... Phew, Income remodeling, as well as they're finding it difficult to find the humans on the ground. And I think part of it is also revisiting our expectations for growth in particular and how we might need to adjust our expectations around that and look at something that's more workable given the resources that we have and the environment in which we find ourselves. Question about leadership of the future. What do you think will continue to be the same? And what might change in terms of developing leadership capabilities? From my perspective, the pendulum always swings back and forth. (laughs) And hopefully we won't go as far back as, you know, back to an authoritarian model from a permissive model. But somewhere in the middle where leaders begin to recognize that, you know, real empowerment for employees comes from employees mastering their roles It doesn't come from leaders and managers absenting themselves and letting employees do whatever and failing to thrive and and failing to master. And, and, And so it's looking at that mastery of task and mastery of expectations as a way of empowering people and having that collective experience, even remotely, whereas Heather said, the the more checking in and engaging in a real authentic way, as opposed to these ideas of engagement that are, I took my team out, you know, this quarter to this place. And, you know, we did all of these falling into each other's arms exercises, and we really came together. And then everybody goes back and nobody is really engaged. And, and so it's, it's looking at the psychology of employee behavior. My hope is that leaders do buy into becoming more psychologically astute because it's expected of them now. They're expected to take care of their people and leaving them alone to do their own thing. It's like abandoning and neglecting a child. They're not going to thrive in that environment and they're, they're going to leave and go somewhere else where they're going to get their needs met. Very helpful insight about developing your people and looking after your people as bubbling to the top in terms of the primary trend that we need to manage. Heather, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think there's a lot of talk right now in the media about leaders needing to become more, you know, more responsible for their emotions of their employees, almost like counselors. And and we've been doing a hard stop with our clients around that and saying, no, 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 (laughs) you're leaders. You need to be attuned to your people, like Anne said, psychologically astute. You need to understand how to create psychological safety in your workplace and be attuned enough that you can direct and provide people with the supports that they might need. But it's not our job to come in here and take on that counseling role as leaders. And I think that, you know, the leaders need to be mindful about that, that place that they're in, uh, 
really supporting their employees to get the best out of their employees, to nurture their employees, and and to, you know, again, as in some of that language, the engagement, the empowerment, all of those things we talk about. But at the end of the day, there's a business need here, and that business need needs to be satisfied. And so when we think about going, having leaders spending all of this time, and we hear it today, it's like, well, you know, I'm supposed to take care of my employees, so that means I have to sit for hours and listen to them as they complain about things. And it's like, no, 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 that's not what we mean. And <laughs> And it's like, we're not responsible for their emotions. And, and every time I have a client that says, you know, they're, you know, they're always asking us what we're doing about burnout. And, and I said, well, where's the burnout? And what, ask them questions, get the information. What's the actual issue, right? And, and yes, it's our job as leaders to problem solve, but we need to problem solve the actual issue, not people's feelings or how, you know, what people's feelings are in response to things. And that's really muddy, I think, still for leaders, in part because they haven't developed up that psychological astuteness that Ann talked about, but also language. Like we do it a lot of the times with our clients. I say, write these phrases down. These are the phrases you need to pull out when these situations present themselves. Because I know for me, even when I was learning, because of course my background's not on the psychological side, but I was out there with clients and Anne was in behind me telling me what to say. And so I could go and do it with more confidence because until the words came naturally, I had a script I was working from. I had them written on a piece of paper that I could refer to and I could pull that language forward. And I I think that's where oftentimes we don't do enough for the leaders to really help them to bridge the gap that they have on from a knowledge and experience perspective is we'll teach them the concept, but, but not give them those really basic fundamental tools that they need. So there's a couple of pieces in there, but I, it's that element where we just, they have to get more comfortable in that interpersonal context and not keep running scared or backing off because somebody gets upset about something or, you know, we've had clients who have not made business decisions because they were afraid of how the employees might get, might react or that they would get upset. And so that we have to navigate our way through that. And I think that's a big part of, you know, sort of where we're going in terms of the future, because we can't move into this place that we're, you know, counselors and all things to all people and you know just it's not going to work for us because we still have businesses at the end of the day that need to produce and need to get outcomes in order for those employees to continue to be employed right that's a really helpful insight thank you heather and i'm thinking about the big words that press buttons for leaders if because they don't know enough about it and because the consequences are so huge things like burnout as you mentioned bullying is another one and so these sort of red flag words when employees blop them on the table, leaders go, ah! uh, you know, there's some stuff that we need to tippy toe around. And I think that's really helpful insight that let's dive into that. Let's know the definition. Let's look at the signs and symptoms so that we can actually tease it apart with people and help us map a way through that whole mess or hmm, chaos. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Your book is fabulous. So you think you can lead. Where can people find out more about your work and the book? So everything um, that we do, our books, access to our podcast and our YouTube channel, all of that can be found at our website, dranitsaris-hilliard.com. So just as it's spelt in our names, uh, really simply dranitsaris.hilliard.com. It's kind of our gateway to all of the different things that we do, all of the work that we do with organizations and individuals, and all of the different resources uh, that we offer people. Thank you so much. We'll make sure that is in the show notes. I have really enjoyed the conversation about everything, leadership and humans and how we're trying to all forge forward together. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having us. Thanks so much. That was a fascinating interview. I really enjoyed the insights around psychology and systems and how we can blend them together. I think that was really helpful insights also about what leaders are confronting in this remote hybrid juggle that we are still working our way through and what we need to pay attention to. And that closing the feedback loop more often is definitely something that we can adopt, whether we're working fully remotely or actually face-to-face as well. And I think it's a nice sort of pendulum swing back to pick up on Anne's analogy there to being too overpandering and looking after our people and being too mindful of their emotions to coming back a little bit and understanding the developmental needs, what are the expectations of leaders and what are the responsibilities of leaders. So as always, plenty to unpack and plenty to process and plenty to keep learning about. 
I recommend the book So You Think You Can Lead if you are an emerging leader or you want to revisit Absolute Fundamentals and get a different perspective and solid strategies and solid advice on what to work on bit by bit. In the meantime, live well, lead well. You've been listening to the Zoe Routh Leadership Podcast. To find out more about leadership of the future or to contact Zoe, go to zoerouth.com. 